Thank you for having me here. Um, I was already introduced. I will just shortly uh, get you an overview of who I am. This talk is about, uh, well, it's called Evil Sins are Free to Play. So I want to show you bad monetization mechanics and hopefully explain to you how you can actually turn them good. Um, I have to put a disclaimer on top of my presentations uh, because my largest client, um, Ubisoft, uh, demands me to have that here. Um, for various reasons, uh, because they don't like me to talk about other games. Uh, so I never talk about Ubisoft games, I just talk about other people games. Um, it's just a legal disclaimer. I was in trouble once because I was too open, so you know, this is the result of it, but you know, everything is fine. Um, who am I? I'm working uh, in the games industry since the 80s, so I'm doing games since nearly 30 years. Um, I have done every job you can name. I was an artist, a designer, a programmer. I ran my own company for 10 years. I was CEO of a public listed company, so basically I did everything you can name, which makes me pretty much a generalist across uh, all uh, jobs in this industry. Um, some of the game of the companies I work for are listed here. Rainbow Arts, no one remembers that, unless you have grown up with uh, Commodore 64 and Amiga. I guess most of you are younger than that computer. Okay, um, and uh, as I said, um, I am also a frequent speaker at uh, conferences like Casual Connect, and I, I love actually being here. Um, some career highlights of games I worked upon. Um, some of them are soft, of course, like the Settlers Online. They're all free to play. Um, I uh, worked on uh, some retail games like Assassin's Creed Black Flag on something called post-launch monetization. So there are, are more and more free-to-play mechanics going even into free to p uh, in uh, AAA console games simply because they want to add revenue after they launch the game and the, g uh, the player reach the end game here. <coughs> uh, my latest game, Assassin's Creed Identity, is on iPad and iOS and Android and has been soft launched in New Zealand and in Australia. So this will be the next free-to-play highlight I actually worked upon. Um, so let's, let's talk about the topic here, sins in free-to-play, whatever sins means. Uh, with sins I mean that things you can do wrong by making money, by let's say getting money from your users, but the users don't feel well giving you that money. This is a trend which has been seen in the press, you know, specifically in the West, uh, a lot of press are talking about the bad sides of free-to-play. Um, I also heard that in Asia they are getting more and more calm, uh, simply because in Asia, you know, free-to-play is much older than the West, uh, nearly 15 years old, something many people forget. Um, so what I try to do here is that I try to identify uncom uncomfortable monetization mechanics and try to tell you why they are uncomfortable to the user. And then I try to turn them good. So the same mechanics, we just twist them a little bit so the user feels better spending money and giving you the revenue you need to actually run your services. And the, the first one I want to add is a so-called fortune wheel. It's very popular in many games, specifically you know, the strategy games like Age of Fire and many other RPGs have this fortune wheel. It's basically just a random lottery ticket. And you get one free item per day or per couple of hours. You know, you just turn the wheel and you get something. Of course, there's one sexy item on the wheel you always want to have. And you can spend money to actually turn the wheel again. Um, why is this evil? Um, it is evil because the user doesn't get what he wants. Usually, the user gets crap in return. And you don't know if the user gets this crap in return, if he can actually even use that crap. For some users, even the crap is good you know, because they are at an early stage in the game or at some stage where he thinks this is really good. But what it actually does is that most of the time the fortune wheel gives the user an item he cannot use. It's not good. So the feedback he gets from the fortune wheel is completely random. And if you're a game designer, feedback should be always positive. The user should always be really happy when he does something in the game. And the fortune wheel actually does, does not do this. Another critical thing is it actually addresses something called gambling weakness. Um, you know, the human brain is weak to certain mechanics you can put in there. You can ask Las Vegas or casinos how they actually use that weakness in humans to actually, you know, get money from them. And the fortune wheel is doing exactly that. Um, the other thing this fortune wheel does is that as soon as you log into the game, the first time the fortune wheel pops up, it immediately communicates this game is pay to play. You know, you see the fortune wheel and you know, if I want to get this item, I actually have to pay the fortune wheel to get it if there's no other source to actually get this item. Um, so, how to fix this is actually pretty easy. Um, I have one example here from Heroes Charts, which is one of the games which, uh, which does it like that. You have to 
integrate the fortune wheel into the game world. So in this game, there's actually a trader in the world itself. You can click the trader, he opens his bag, and he shows you six random items. And you can pick one of these and actually buy it. So it's the same principle. There is a random set of items you show, but the user doesn't get crap in return because it's his choice whether or not he wants to get the item or not. And often there are really cool items for a really good price in there, meaning that you know the, the really the winning feel is still there and the revenue source is still identical. And the user doesn't feel cheated because it's not like on top of the whole game, like this pay-to-play uh, pay mechanic. Nevertheless, you know, the, the guy is sitting in your game world and showing you his wares, and the wares are just random. There's a refresh button on top where you can still refresh the wares if you want to pay and just have another selection. So it's the same revenue source, it's the same principle, but it's much more naturally integrated and fixes most of the problems Fortune's wheels have. So you don't get crap in return, it fixes this is pay to play method and so on. So this is very easy how we integrate a fortune wheel mechanic into the game world. Um, and most games actually don't see that. They still have the fortune wheel there. The next one, mystery boxes or Russian boxes, or you know, there are many names for that. Again, this is an item. You, you have a sealed box, you open it, and there's a random item coming out of it. So it's comparable to the fortune wheel and it's even worse than the fortune wheel because you don't see what you get at first. The fortune wheel at least shows you what possibility you have, you know, what items you could get. But in the mystery box you have no idea. So you just open it up and some random comes out. And um, you can buy more boxes and hope there's a really good item in there. And sometimes people talk about it, what really cool item they got out of the box, but you know, you yourself, if you buy like 10 boxes of these and you have crap in return, you will never buy a box again from that, you know, because you just say, ah, it's just crap in there. Um, so again in here, purely random rewards is random feedback. Random feedback is really bad for game design. You know, you should have absolute control over positive and negative feedback in your game. It doesn't address all payer types. This needs a little bit of explanation. Um, when people spend for a game, uh, they spend it for a certain purpose. There is a certain player who loves power items. There's a certain player who loves cosmetic items. There's a certain player who loves acceleration in time, meaning that they love to accelerate progress. You know, there are various payer types and they prefer certain items to actually help them in the game. Um, and a mystery box does not support any of these. It's just purely random coming out of that. But if you want to optimize your optimization, you have to have items for any payer type in your game. And if you leave out one payer type, basically you're losing revenue. And the mystery box, you know, is just making chaos out of that strategy because you have no idea what you, you, what you give the, the player in itself. Um, it turns pay users who don't get what they want. So if your main um, monetization mechanic is mystery boxes and if a paying user spend 10, 20, 50 dollars on these boxes and still don't have the item th they want, they might actually stop paying because they are frustrated. They might even stop playing because they think you cheat on them. Um, Again, in terms of game design, you know, random um, uh, feedback harms good progression systems. Random rewards hurt good game balancing because imagine there's a player who's just level 10 and he gets this really powerful level 15 item. Guess what happens if he reaches le level 15? He just rushes through your content. You don't want that. You want to have absolute control and balancing that the player goes through your content at a pace you control and not want the randomness of these boxes control. So how to fix this is uh, a little bit uh, more complicated, but still it's easy. Uh, for my strategy, I recommend my clients, you should never use mystery boxes as your main monetization system. Many games do that. I think this is a huge mistake. As a supplementary system, it actually works. So if you have a good monetization system there and you add mystery boxes, there's a certain payer type who actually likes these boxes. You can address these by selling these, these boxes, but there should be different ways getting the items inside the box as well. In here, I also add that the box should communicate what's inside, what could be inside, and the chances to get it. So if there is this really rare super item everybody wants, and it says this item, let's say Sword of Power, has a 1% chance to be in this box, everybody who buys the boxes knows what the chances are. Now what you additionally do is that you put the sword as a direct sale into the shop much more expensive than you would create a 1% chance to actually buy the boxes itself. Now here's the thing. 
There are payers who want to directly get the items they pay for, and they don't care if the item they buy directly is much more expensive than the mystery boxes would be to actually get the item. They just want to guarantee they get the item in return. So if you do that dual system, you're actually making more money than just with the mystery boxes. Um, and this fixes most issues of the mystery boxes themselves. Um, I usually recommend adding the mystery boxes at a later point in the game lifecycle. So once you have your monetization system set up and your game is operational for a couple of months and really stable and everything goes, you can actually add the mystery boxes later on. But you should not actually do that from the beginning. There are many games out there who have this as their main monetization system. Some games even sell the keys to the boxes. So you have the mystery box, you don't know what's inside, but you cannot open it. You have to buy a key to actually do that, which is like doubling the negative reward, right? So you have to have the key. If you have the key, you open it. You paid for the key, but there's crap in return. Well, it's uh, a double-edged sword here. Okay, next one, um, concealing and hiding. Concealing and hiding means that the game is hiding uh, valuable information from the player on purpose. Um, Again, I give you an example of Heroes Charge. On the top left, the screenshot shows you the heroes you can unlock. Um, you have no idea what the hero does. You don't have the powers, you don't know how strong he is, what his specialization is, nothing. You actually have to access the internet to actually find out. And this is concealing information from the players. But why? If they would tell players what these heroes are, they would actually work for them, and you know, it's, it's good for revenue, it's good for lifetime, it's good for everything, but the game is actually hiding that on purpose. Um, the same applies to Puzzle and Dragons. They don't sell you, uh, tell you w what monsters you need to actually fuse something together in the special fusion. Um, and most people go to the Puzzle and Dragons online databases to actually find out and to grind for these monsters. If they would communicate all that, I think that players would be much more integrated to the game. Nevertheless, they have success, at least in Japan. Um, but they are hiding information. <coughs> Another thing, again, Heroes Charge, you see the mystery boxes on the lower right. Uh, they give you free mystery boxes per day. So the left side is the soft currency mystery box. You get five per day for free, and you can buy them for the soft currency. The middle one is the premium currency, the hard currency uh, one. You get uh, one for free every two days. And the third one, that was a surprise, only appears in the game when you spend 500 euros or more. No one knows it's there unless you spend over 500 euros. And suddenly, bam, it pops up and you can have that special mystery box. Again, this is hiding valuable information from players. And if some players who just spent 480 euros and is you know, short before stopping the game would know this exists, they would actually continue paying. So uh, why hiding information? Uh, you, know, you basically don't know. It's the same with uh, Candy Crush Saga. They're hiding the prices and how many you can buy. You just click on add some booster, and suddenly they say, hey, you can buy three boosters for a dollar. Uh, they could have told you that on the first screen, but they don't. They basically hide you the, the price performance ratio later on in the screen. <coughs> so why is it bad? It's really obvious. The user doesn't see what he gets. That's the same thing with the mystery boxes. You know, mystery boxes are hiding information. It's the same principle here, but more general. The user is left in the dark about the item powers itself. So often you buy an item and you see the good powers, but the bad powers of the item were hidden unless you actually own it and use it. Suddenly you see, ah, this item is not as good as it should be. Um, the user might never pay or pay less if he doesn't know. Um, and in the consequence, you know, which is the lower one, is this essentially lying to your users if you hide information. And users are not stupid. If you hide information from them and they get the information in an indirect way or when it's too late, they blame you as an operator and not the game itself. And when they start blaming you, you know, they're, they might actually leave the game or not pay as much as they would like. They love you as an operator. So how to fix this is really easy. You know, you usually should reveal all powers of items, even the negative ones. And usually for game balancing, you know, powerful items have a negative side uh, on there as well. Simply tell the users they're really happy about that. Reveal all consequences of user actions. So when you buy or unlock something and there's a negative side effect, don't surprise the user about that. You should tell him from the start when he does that. And never force the user to do something. Uh, I can give you a really simple example. Uh, many tutorials give the user ten diamonds and force him to spend the ten diamonds into the shop to circle him through the shop experience so he learns where the shop is. But users don't like to be forced to spend hard currency even if he gifted it to them. You should not do that. Users hate that part of the tutorial. So it's much better to give him the ten diamonds 
and then give him a quest. Listen, if you spend this 10 diamonds in the shop, here it is, you get 20 diamonds in return. He can choose not to and keep the 10 diamonds, but he could actually get this and get twice in return. So with that, you have a positive effect because he learned how the shop works. He got twice the reward he actually got and he's really happy about you because you gave him just 20 diamonds. On the other hand, you didn't force him to do something he didn't like. And this is the same thing, you know, you should never force the user to actually do anything in the, the game, you know, it should be like his choice to do that. It's a clear and open information and communication and you should do that in all ends, even if your game breaks down, the servers are down or whatever, you know, you basically say, listen, servers are down uh, because, you know, we broke the firewall, we are really sorry about that. Don't lie to the users, you know, don't shut down the game for two hours because you have to do maintenance and when the game is open up you just apologize to them that's too late because they were just offline for two hours you should tell them in advance or through other other communication channels how to do that um, you know it's part of the don't conceal or hide information from the users um, and this is the thing which i learned from being really honest to our users uh, we even told them when we royally screwed up like when we really make a really bad mistake and we said sorry, we really have this bad thing going on. This is why, this is how we are trying to fix it. It might cause problems for you. We are really sorry about this, but at least we are telling you in advance. Users love you being honest, even if it's bad news. It creates loyalty and lifetime if you do that. That's a strange thing, but you know, users appreciate honesty. Um, and loyal users are better payers and players, of course. That's really obvious. So, Something else called parameter change. Parameter change means that a game changes the parameter, any parameter of the game, depending on your behavior. Uh, you see from the screenshot which company actually did this in Extreme, which is called Zynga. And you actually see where Zynga is now. No one talks about them anymore. They're no longer sexy. Maybe this is one of the reasons. Uh, you see here that they're offering um, a VIP club offer, which is identical to the right one, to one user for $15 to another user for $25. Guess what the differences between these users were? The left user was a non-paying user, the right user was a paying user. So they knew this user paid, and once you paid, it's easier to convince them to pay more than someone to who never paid to convert that guy to a paying user. Because they knew that, they, they generally charged more from paying users than from non-paying users. And, and they got away with it. And this is not something I actually you know, recommend doing. Because the user isn't stupid, he will really realize that, he will talk about it, and he will get, you know, he feels cheated upon. You know, my wife gets the same offer for 10 bucks, you know, why I have to pay 20 bucks, why is that? Um, no one likes that. You know, every user should be handled equally. Um, the user feels cheated upon, even lied upon, and he blames you as an operator. It's the same thing like before, but on a different context. And the parameter change can be anything, right? Difficulty, progression, rewards. Zynga even lowered the rewards for paying users compared to non-paying users, simply because they knew that the paying users have a harder time, and having a harder time means they pay more. That's what they did. And you should not uh, adapt that tactic. So how to fix it is really simple. All users should be handled equally. Just same parameters, same game, you know, just let them go differently through your game progress depending on, the, on their skill. Gameplay should not be different depending on user's behavior. It should not. <coughs> and this is even more important for paying users because they are paying you salaries. You should not, you know, handle them unequally. And uh, for me personally and for most users out there, this is a requirement for online games. Uh, online games, most games out there are online now and people talk to each other and if you handle them differently, they will know, and as, as soon as this news spread, you will have negative feedback and less revenue. So the fix is really easy, never do this. Be honest, they are your customer. This is like the easiest fix you can have. Don't do that. It's a very um, common thing for pure monetization designers who have nothing in their mind but to raise revenue to actually try this. Most monetization designers who are just out there to do revenue will try this and you should stop them doing it because it will cost your users in the long run. And as an example, you can actually see that if a company does a fair business, they're still in business today. And if they don't do fair business, they will end up like Zynga. Retention tricks. Um, this is a really, let's say, a soft evil sin. With retention tricks, I'm meaning things which cost hours, days, or weeks to complete or to gain. Like here, we have a daily login bonus 
the login bonus actually is a evil mechanic. You will now think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I will explain you in a second. There's another one, which is the gold chest from Heroes Chart. It tells you that this free chest you can get in 43 hours, 46 minutes and 7 seconds. You get one for free. What happens to a user who wants to optimize his rewards in a game when he sees this? He will set his alarm to exactly this time and wake up whatever time it is per day. This is what happens to power users. They will wake up at 3.30 in the morning just to get this free chest to rerun the timer on the next chest so that they don't miss at least one minute of free time where the timer doesn't run. The same applies to a login bonus. With a login bonus, you're forcing a user to log in every single day to maximize his rewards. The same applies to timed uh, principles, like if you have a game mechanic, I press a button and it says it finishes in 24 hours, I will log in in 24 hours to get the reward and start the timer again. And what happens here is that if I log, let's say my, log my, my bonus timer runs out at 5 p.m. I log in at 5 p.m. 5 minutes. So I get my reward, I start the timer again. If I do this every day, at some point I have to activate the timer after midnight when I actually should sleep or take care of my kids. Because I can never log in exactly at 5. So the timer is actually running you know, me late on purpose. So at some point I'm missing one timer simply because I don't get what I want. That's the reason why usually these timers, which last 24 hours, should be set to either daily reset in the night or it should be 23 hours, not 24. That's a really easy fix. So how to fix this? You know, you should reward gameplay and not login. Uh, a login bonus is a fine system, but if you want to have a really cool login system, you should do something like Puzzle and Dragons does. They simply count up how many times you logged in and give you a reward depending on how many times you logged in. And they don't reset that when you just missed a week. So if someone logs in every day, after 300 days, he gets a really cool reward. If someone logs in every second day, he just gets the same reward after 600 days. They don't care. You get the same thing, just on different speed. So don't reset these timers. Meaning that you should not punish the users missing these logins and cooldowns. And the second thing, really easy, is you know you should lose cooldowns with buffers. So either use 23 hours into 24, so I have like one, two, three hours lag, or you just reset the timers automatically in the morning. Um, these tactics actually were corrected by Blizzard in World of Warcraft when they started their daily quest system. Many users complained that at some point they had to wake up in the middle of the night, and at that point, Blizzard actually changed their cooldown timers to 23 hours or once per day. So next thing, this is the one which usually gets most discussed upon, item sales. With item sales I mean that in your game you're offering items for a discount. This is not good. It costs you revenue, it costs you users, it costs you a lot more. And this is really hard to prove in a such session like that, but there has been a lot of economical research about that, that this is damaging. Um, examples here is, you know, from mobile games, weekly sale, like this week, 50% off, um, you know, you sale of items, you know, everybody is doing this. You know, there's, I, I guess visually there's no one in this room who does not run item sales. But here's the thing. First, item sales usually work on popular items. If you try to make item sales on crap items, they won't sell anyway, because users know that they are crap. So your money makers are suddenly offered as a discount. And when you do that, it destroys the price perception and the value perception of the item in the user's mind. If there's an item for $50 and suddenly it's for $20 available, I will pay for that item $20 because it's a sale, it's a deal, your revenue will spike, but that user will never buy the item for $50 again because they know at some point you will run a sale again. And that destroys long-term revenue and lifetime in your game. It's proven by economists, you know, there are a lot, you can Google that, it's, uh, it's easy research, uh, where does that, uh, where you can actually, you know, read about this. So sales destroy the perceived value in the user's mind, and this has been proven. Um, why do sales work in real life? We all have been raised that sales are happening out there in stores. You know, when there's, sale on summer cloth, you know, most women go into the cloth store, their favorite ones, and try to grab their favorite summer stuff. If there's sale on LG electronics and some electronics store, you know, you will buy your LG or Samsung TV, you know, at a sale price. We have been risen by sales are there, and we are looking for these discount. Amazon Black Monday, you know, many, many things there. 
The reason these cells exist are either overstock, they have too many of these left, or competition. So there's a competing item and the guy who wants to do a sale actually wants to throw out the competition out of that sales window. Here's a funny thing though, in your game there is no such thing as a competition. There is no such thing as an overstock, so there's no reason to run a sale. This you know, has to sink in. Whenever you run a sale, your revenue spikes, which is good, right? You say you're all happy, but if you, over years of the operation of your game, analyze what these sales have done to your user base, you will see that it has a negative feedback. And this is something you should carefully look into when you run sales. So in the long term, it will actually reduce revenue. There are many economical experts out there who recommend never to run sales. Never, ever. I'm not really fan of that because sales actually do work in certain um, uh, systems. So how can we actually fix that? It's very simple. You should do sales on the currency, but not on items. Leave the item prices in your game like they are. Don't touch them. But the currency you usually buy to buy these items, you can run a sale on this. And this does not destroy the perceived value of the items that you just mined. That's the astonishing thing. So whenever you do a sale, do it on the currency. And the cool thing here is that when you run a sale on a popular item, you're only addressing part of your players, right? Because not everybody is at the stage in the game to actually afford or who needs this item. But if you do a sale on the currency, everybody can enjoy the sale and buy whatever he wants. So, so you will have the revenue spike. But there are certain rules you have to apply if you do sales on currency. They have to be chaotic, not regular. There are certain percentages you should actually use, you know, uh, and not use some others. And there has been research about the interne internet as well. I can send you the links if you want to. So there are specific rules you have to follow. And if you do that, you don't even destroy the perceived value of the currency itself. But if you run the currency sales too often, even then regular payers will stop buying currency and only buy when you run the sales. So you have to be careful about that and there are certain rules how to actually run these that they are more efficient. Um, what you can do also is that instead uh, of running sales, you can actually add free items to the package. It's another funny side effect. If you never run a sale on the currency, but you add items here and there to the packages, the perceived value of the item you give them is not destroyed because you got it for free as a gift from you to the service. And the value of the item they, they assign to the gift is still the one which is in the game itself. So this is another trick you can run where this uh, problem doesn't exist. So next thing, energy systems is an evil thing. Why is that? Energy systems, classic, everybody knows that. You have an energy bar and if you do any action, the energy bar depletes and if it's zero, you have to stop playing until it refreshes. If it's life, like in Candy Crush, or energy, like in so many other games, doesn't matter. Uh, this system has been made popular by Facebook, and the reason it was there, the energy system, is to actually delay the player to enter the end of your game. Because there wasn't enough content to in this game, they, they friction down the player speed by introducing the energy system. So, why is it bad? The first thing, it communicates pay to play immediately. Energy bar with a dollar sign or a plus sign immediately tells the user, if you want to play as long as you like, you have to pay. And that's bad because, you know, players want to experiment. They want to see if they like your game or not. So energy system in this is not really good. It limits fun. Players love to experiment. They love to experiment in your game. Do whatever they want, not what you want them to do. And an energy system applies a negative feedback to every action they do. Because it costs energy, they say, uh, I don't really want to click this button now. But experimentation is good, right? Experiment is good. So if you're hindering them experimenting, you're limiting their fun because there are players who love to experiment. And energy systems basically cost you exactly that user who loves to experiment. It also communicates your inability to design and have content. That's the truth. Players are not stupid, right? So if you put an energy system on there, you know, they immediately know, huh, okay, this game is so short, they had to put an energy system in there that I actually have to wait in order to play. Um, the other one, which is kind of a side effect, that energy is not optimizable by the user. So there's an energy bar, 100%, and I cannot get the bar to 200% in any way. So it, you dictate the content of the energy bar to the user. I cannot optimize it. 
Um, and of course, the energy is not naturally integrated into the game world. It's like this artificial bar on top, which sits there, always communicating, you know, don't press this action because it might cost you energy. This is not good. But luckily, there's a really easy fix for all of us. So, how to fix it? First thing is, you give the energy into the player's hands. So, make the energy a resource, give it to the player, let him produce the resource, and he can use it up. If that resource is at zero, he can no longer do certain actions. Suddenly, the whole thing is reversed. It no longer communicates pay to play, it's really easy, and the player has this feeling of ownership about the energy, it's his, he can spend it, it's suddenly his resource, and he can optimize it. He can increase the production value, he can increase how much energy he has in his, in his warehouses, everything. Suddenly the whole energy suddenly becomes a game mechanic and not this bar on top, pay to play. Um, and you know, if you want to have a perfect sample here, see Clash of Clans, they have three energies in their system. Everybody talks about resources in Clash of Clans, but for me it's an energy system. You have that violet stuff, that green stuff, and another stuff. And you're just using them up for certain things, either to build stuff, to attack someone, or to recruit certain things. And it's the same, same thing here, right? The energy depletes. If it's zero, you just wait until it produces again. I can optimize that. No one complains about that, because it's a natural thing in the game world that it happens. But on the bottom line, this is an energy system. And what's really good, if you give the energy to the player, suddenly you can give many energy systems to the player. Two, three, hundreds. My record is 170 energy systems in one game. Okay, it's a resource-driven game, so you handle resources, and every single resource is an energy, right? But nevertheless, you know, people love it because they can optimize the hell out of that. We even introduced converters where you can convert one energy into the other, you know, and w at a cost, and a, you know, but nevertheless, people like that. So this is really easy to fix, an energy system is a thing Facebook invented. Facebook games are no really profitable anymore. We moved on, so it's time to drop five, six year old game mechanics because you know there are much more modern game mechanics out there. So just look at the games who actually dis uh, does this without energy systems. The best thing of course is running without energy systems at all, but then you have to have a really generic game which actually can cope with players playing 20 hours per day. So the next bad monetization mechanic, is steal from the player. Even worse, is steal from the payer. Now you say, no game steals from the player, right? Well, you're wrong. i give you one example here. It's a game where you pay, how much is that? 14,000 of your currency to own this weapon for 14 days. It's a rental system. So I pay my money I spend to the game to get this weapon for two weeks, and after that, it's gone. Would you pay for this gun? No, you wouldn't. Rental systems don't work. Because it violates this rule, you should never take things away from the player he earned by skill, time, or money. If someone buys an item for real dollars, and, the, and after two weeks you just remove all these items from the game, all players would actually show you the finger and leave the game. So you don't do that. For you it's natural, but this is the main reason why rental systems don't work. Players want to own things they pay for. And with pay, I don't necessarily mean money. I mean money, skill, or time. So here it is, you know. Items earned belong to the player. Not legally, but in the game itself, this is what they like. If they own, earn something in the game, they like owning it and possess it. They love collecting it. They love collecting hundreds of items. They want to own that stuff. Even brag about it. Look here what I have. You can take a look in World of Warcraft. If someone plays for like five or ten years, the first thing he does when you look into his account is open his bank account. Like all these windows open and all his stuff. Look at this item. I earned that seven years ago. No one has it, but I still have it. This is what you want to create, right? If someone plays your game for five years, he still has items in his inventory which are years old, and he's proud having these. And being proud about having an item in your game means that he will never stop playing your game. It's really easy. So don't take that stuff away, even if it's really old, right? There are ways removing old items from the player if he you know, d does it by his own decision, but this is a different design topic, so we just stay here. So renting systems remove value of items. It lessens itemization. Itemization means ownership, collecting, and all that. Um, the hesitance to buy and investing in items which just last temporarily. 
even let's say you don't have a rental system, you just have permanence, you can sell in consumables. Consumables, the player knows. If I, if I buy that and use it, it's gone. If I buy a permanent, I own it forever. Now, for some reason, you decide to remove an item from the game because it's unbalanced or wrong or whatever you do and remove the whole item from the game. Players suddenly realize that they no longer have ownership of their items and they know that whatever I own could be removed by you, by the operator. They no longer feel secure spending money in your game because at some point, hey, they removed that one item and, you know, I, I feel bad spending money because they might actually remove that as well, right? This is the feeling you, you have to, to prevent uh, in, the, in the player base. So, you know, be careful when you remove items from your player base. Actually, you should not. So, and it includes other systems, not only rental systems, but you know, the bad thing is durability systems, rental systems, you know. Uh, durability systems are systems where you have a sword and it lasts for a certain time until it breaks and then it's destroyed or you have to repair it. It's the same thing. It, it creates a hesitance to use cool items. Many ro RPGs, you know, you get this rod of superpower and you know, you would love to use that, but you don't because you want to save the charges for the really cool boss. But guess when the really cool, cool, cool boss comes in the game? Never. When the player quits the game, he still has this rod unused in his bank. That's not what you want to uh, create, right? So durability systems, again, is the same thing. How to fix it is really easy. Do not use rental systems. They do not work. I have many clients approaching me, specifically clients who want to do free-to-play first-person shooters. Um, don't do rental systems, they simply don't work. Do not use durability systems, there are other systems you can use instead, so they lessen player willingness to actually use these items. Do not take items away from players, never do this. Not even seasonal items. If I invested time, skill or money in an item, I own it. Don't take that away. That's really hard sometimes for designers, but you know, there are ways around that. Make permanence permanent and that players feel assured that wh whatever they own, they never lose. So, next one, clickbait. Everybody knows what clickbait is, right? Um, perfect example, King.com still uses clickbaits. Um, clickbaits are the evil form, like, you know, no more lives. Actually, my game ends, I have to wait until the energy system uh, reloads. So energy systems, you know, they could actually replace that. And I can ask friends, Facebook or I can pay 99 cents for like three lives or one kind of move, so it's really expensive. And the button is green. Everybody presses on the green button because the button to continue for free is actually the, rot, uh, the red X on the top right. That's not a good UI. The UI is designed that people, people by accident clicks on the 99 cent button. Of course, there's still the, 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 the pay dialogue coming after that, so I can cancel. But when they have a dual currency system, and some of these games have that, it actually says 10 gold to continue, which is a bug. And they give you 50 gold in, you know, at the beginning to play with. There's literally no player I have talked to who not accidentally spent 10 by clicking on this button. Most of these people, you know, I see many people nodding here already. M most people actually click that by accident. Clickbait is really bad. It's, you know, users hate when they fall for that trap and guess who they blame your company, your UI designers. Why can't you fix this sucky UI? Well, they are not stupid. They know you did it on purpose to actually grind away that free currency or currency in general. But you know, this is what happens. Your UI sucks in the user's mind, so your game sucks. This is what users basically you know, go in here. So clickbait should not be used. It's obvious an evil mechanic. The user isn't stupid. They know you're doing this just for making money, so you spoil the fun in their game itself. And ultimately, it lessens the conversion lifetime because there are some users quitting the game in frustration. Imagine there's a user who just spent five euros in the game or five dollars, and this is like the only money he can spend in the game because he doesn't own more money, right? And he saved his last 10 gold bars he have just for this one level he knows his hearts and by accident falls for your clickbait. Guess what that user does? He will give up infestation and quit the game forever. You just lost him. And that's something you should not do. So how to fix it is like the easiest one. Do not use clicks, click baits. You should make spending money a good experience and not a bad one. If someone pays for your game, it should be the best experience in the world. It should not be a negative one. And I can give you a lot of examples in the real world how the difference is. Guess why 
Who has a PC laptop? Hands up. PC laptop. Hands up. Okay. Who has a Apple laptop? Hands up. Okay. You know what? Five years ago, if I would have asked this question, there would be one hand who owns an Apple MacBook. Guess why half of you now own Apple and the other ones own PC? It's really easy. Because when you buy a MacBook in an Apple store, it's an awesome experience. If you buy a PC laptop, the experience sucks really bad. This is the difference, right? It doesn't mean the Mac laptop is a better machine, you know? There are really nice PC laptops out there. No, the experience buying one is much, much better. And the same thing you should do in your game. When someone decides to spend money, make it the most awesome experience ever. And, you know, don't try to milk your user out of his money for that. So thank you very much. This is a quick overview of the 10 lessons I gave you. Actually, I cheated. There were 11 lessons if you counted that. So I just added one as a bonus. Um, you can actually watch all my dissecting talks on Cattle Connect uh, websites about World of Tanks, Puzzle and Dragons, League of Legends, and the King Games. I did four of them uh, for now. And if you would do me a favor, and if you have the chance to test out the latest game I worked upon, which is Assassin's Creed Identity by Ubisoft, out on Android and iOS soon, but soft launch in Australia and New Zealand, I would love your feedback. And here's my contact data. Um, you can ask me any questions you like. Okay, I'm open for questions now, and thank Excellent you for Excellent talk by Toy. Uh, now uh, the floor is open for questions, so does anyone have questions? Yes. Uh, during your talk, you said you made uh, a game that has about 100 over systems or energy systems. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe know what's the game name? Uh, game name? Which has energy systems? The the one that you had the most energy systems, I think. Uh, the uh, settlers online. Sorry. The settlers online. Oh, I see. Ando online has the same. So it's like 150 different resources you use up or do certain things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Questions. Um, my, I have a question. Um, what about uh, combining rental with purchase? So, for example, you have a, a very high-powered item, but to allow uh, lower-level people to have a taste of it, you offer them a lower pr price rental, but then there's also a, a purchasing price where they then own it. Yeah, um, a good idea. Baki, it circumvents the rental problem. But here's the thing. If the item is expensive, users expect it to, to perform really well because that's the reason why it is expensive. So if you need to rent out the item to make the purchase more sexier, then the item is wrong. So an expensive item should be something players really work for, and if they, if they buy it, you know, this experience where it's really cool should be worth that money they put into it. If you have to rent out that thing to advertise the item first, you, know, you might lose customers who suddenly think, no, that item is not what I expected it to be. And if you have to rent it out to ma actually make advertising for that, then the item might be priced wrong uh, f in, th in the first run. Yeah. Thank you for your speech. Uh, tell me, please, what is the best uh, monetization uh, system, by your opinion? <laughs> what is better to use it in mobile platforms? The There's not one good system. Um, there are a lot of bad ones, as you see, but you can turn them good. Um, Every game needs a specific monetization system, but there are so many common things every game has to have that you can make a, a set of rules every game has to follow to monetize really well. I have that set of rules. I actually do that with my customer, with my clients. I have to access to that. And most games who follow that actually are you know, successful in terms of monetization. But there's not this one best monetization system out there. Um, it doesn't exist. Um, but every game which monetizes well has a progression system every single one. Meaning that if you want to make a game which monetizes well, you must have a progression system. So the common thing between all games who are performing really well, all the stuff which all of them have in common, I analyze and put on a rule set. And you can do that yourself if you want to, you know, it's nothing you have to pay me for. Um, it's really easy and progression system is one of them. And the other thing you have to realize, and this is something many people forget, even the guys who invented it who were in this room, um, the Koreans invented free-to-play 15 years ago. And most monetization systems for free-to-play were designed for MMORPGs. And most games who monetize really well adapted a lot of MMORPG systems. 
in order to monetize well. And that should get you thinking, so maybe good monetizi monetizing MMORPGs are the way to analyze better than you know, all the other games in order to learn what monetizes good and what doesn't. Yeah. But th there's not this one monetization favorite one. If that would exist, everybody would do it. And then it would actually stop working. <laughs> so it's, no, there's not this one golden thing. There are like a whole set of things and they work like this. And then suddenly your machine is in motion. Long answer for a short question. Sorry for that. Uh, about the mystery boxes, we yeah. always speak about the data analysis and these kind of things. And what if we understand the player and in fact on, uh, use the data analysis to know what they like, what they want, and in fact give them the mystery boxes, mm -hmm. but be sure what they have is something they want or, yep. or they need. So, so you're basically saying you want to adapt the content of the mystery box to that the user actually has a use of most of these items. That's what you're saying. What you're basically saying is that you're redesigning your store to better fit the player's needs. So instead of giving him a box where he gets a random item, why not give him something he really wants and he pays for? Because that's what you're basically saying. You give him a random thing, but he doesn't want that random thing. He just wants one specific item in there and he would love to pay for it, but you're hindering it for them. Yes, it's a, it's a right step in the right direction. You know, just give him stuff he really needs and not crap in return. But that also violates the rule where it says handle all players equally. Because imagine I open a box and I get this really cool item. Yippee, I finally have it. And the other guy who is, let's say, slightly different and you're mixing his box slightly differently because he has different needs, doesn't get it. But he really wants to have that, although his class doesn't really is suited for this. Suddenly you have in, an imbalance. If a user wants an item, sell it directly to him. Why not? You can make lotteries as an event, you can make mysteries as an event, mystery box as an event, no problem at all. But don't rely your whole monetization system on it. That's a mistake. As you said, as an add-on, you know, as for an event for two weeks or you know, have mystery boxes as a supplementary monetization system, no problem. But it's a main monetization system you should know. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, hi. So actually my question is about mystery boxes and a bit about concealing. Yeah. So actually some of the games that I like, for example, one of the games you've got up there, Puzzle and Dragons, right, does use a uh, mystery box mm -hmm. as its main monetization yes. mechanic. And I'm wondering about the feasibility of such things. <coughs> so part of my, my question is, I think, um, are there fair ways to do that? And I, I think maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing on my own that maybe there might be because the way I see some of the mystery boxes done, uh, one of the things that you said was it, the game should re reward skill and effort, right? Yep. In these games, mostly actually you might grind for the mystery boxes. Yep. And if the player doesn't get what they want, yep. then in a way, uh, it's sort of fair. Because if I, for example, can buy a very powerful dragon for 99.99 straight off, then that game turns into direct pay to win. Yes. And, you, than and you're perfectly right. I actually forgot to mention the exception to the rule. And the exception to the rule is what I call trading card games. Trading card games are essentially designed around the fact that the access to the, to the rarity of the certain, let's say, monsters is part of the whole gameplay. Then suddenly it works if there are other rules you follow, you have to put into the game, are there as well. If the mystery box is only just for being random, this is not what you have. But in Puzzle and Dragons, if you need a rare monster, you can actually grind for that egg in specific dungeons if you know where it is. Yep. And you get free, s you know, you can grind for the currency, you can actually buy the egg, so you get it, so you can increase the chances to actually get that stuff, and then you can pimp this one monster by grinding certain stuff. Um, and essentially, Puzzle and Dragons is a trading card game. D let's say a trading egg game, how you can call that? I don't know, but you know what I mean. Yep. But, but games like Hearthstone, the same thing. You know, Hearthstone, trading card game, Magic the Gathering, all this kind of stuff. This is the big exception to the rule because it's not only the monetization mechanic on the mystery boxes, but it's the whole game evolving around that concept. And suddenly, at that point, yes, you can do that. That's Thank exception you. to the rule. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, one, one really quick related question. So. Uh, yeah, actually those are some of my favorite genres and I think maybe it helps build community. And the second question is about concealment as one of the things that you highlighted. In some cases, might concealment also be useful for building community? 
Like say if it generates talk or users to create a wiki about say someone yes. grinds for specific information yeah, yeah. and then they post that information for other yeah. users, would that actually uh, I, in some cases help? I agree. If the information is discoverable in the game itself, but not every user has access to it yet, users start to build communities about the knowledge they have. You're totally right, you're fine. The problem is this works on PC really well, on mobile it doesn't work really well. Because for mobile the web really doesn't exist, only apps exist. So you have to ask a user to write an app for the database for your game. I don't know, it's hard. I guess for mobile it might be different. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah.